Thì mình nói không phải như những cái thứ But the way Brown has framed is that because there aren't um, enough de Republicans to filibuster things, everything's happening in backroom deals. Right. He uses the phrase backroom deals. That's a very smart he, frame. It is a smart frame. He, and again, like every, every campaign that's winning is brilliant, but this one especially, to win a campaign in Massachusetts as a Republican who's not actually that moderate is, is something. And I've, I, I talk to these voters who, you know, some of them are kind of soft. I always ask, you know, if you're a Republican, if you just started supporting him recently, and I've dabbed up to people who are unaffiliated, you know, they like Ted Kennedy, but they're really angry that the health care bill is being debated in these back rooms and they had to give a deal to somebody to pass it. And I just, I talk to them and, and say, you realize that if this happens, they'll probably try to cram through something anyway, even worse. I mean, we, if we, and it's, at this point, we're just, you know, you know boxing shadows because nothing like that, nothing's going to change about this recently. I did see... Uh, Joe Biden say something in Florida about how the su supermajority super is Yeah, but they're not going to touch it. You can't touch that when you're losing your, your supermajority. You know, you can do it when the other party is in power when you got a supermajority, but it sort of can't be your response to losing an election. You know, I'll just yeah. say one thing on the back of deals because I found this to be a really fascinating thing to watch. I think it's very mm -hmm. smart framing for the Brown campaign. But, of course, you think of the Gang of Six, right, which was your real sort of Republican bipartisan mm -hmm. process there, which was, of course, a back of deal. I mean, everything has always been backroom deals. Watching the, watching, there, there's been sort of a, a funny thing in the media where I, I always feel that the, the job of the Washington media, in theory, mm -hmm. is to study Washington and then sort of come to you and say, here's how it really is. But in fact, what they do is they sort of, they figure out what the country thinks and then put themselves in the country's shoes and then try to interpret it as the country already would, which you're seeing with these backroom deals. You know, there's this real sort of, I'm shocked, shocked to find that politics is happening in this Congress. Attitude yeah. on the part of a lot of these people, as if the Nelson's deal is somehow strange, as if, you know, we didn't, you know, I, I mean, you probably remember, but a lot of people don't know what was done to pass Medicare Part D, where there were multiple ethics complaints, where somebody tried to, right. where delay tried to bribe people. But even just going back and back and back, I mean, Medicare Part D is, I'm sorry, not Part D, Medicare itself is entirely a deal between Wilbur Mills and Johnson. I mean, you just go to anything, and there's just always been people horse trading to get things. And the Nebraska horse trade wasn't even a very big horse trade. I mean, one thing you're seeing is that I think that, yeah, I do wonder how much our system can function under uh, an, uh, the sort of national and polarized media that delivers ideological types of transparency. Because the way they've always made things work out is these sort of deals, he's using pork to grease the way for things. And, and it's going to be really, really difficult on them. If the new thing is that you can't yeah. negotiate for anything. Well, I would say that Brown, Brown is on some solid footing here because he, if he doesn't, someone else in the, in the crowd will hearken to Obama's campaign promise that mm -hmm. the health care debate was going to happen in front of C-SPAN cameras. And there are smart Republicans who point this out and point out the videos of Obama doing this. Obama said that. Um, I'm not sure why he said that. Uh, <laughs> he, he can't have had it because... Like that. Well, because but I, wish didn't say. I don't know what you mean by partisan transparency, but I have noticed if really since early 2009, I talked to people like Grover Norquist who um, are pretty naked about the, the, the idea that if there's total transparency and everyone reads what's in every bill, there's going to be something they can get angry about, right. and there'll be another thing they can angry, get angry about, and they can kind of unspool this by pointing out that every bill is actually a casserole of handouts to awful, to awful people. Right. It's hard, to under, it's hard to understand because it's not like we have representative democracy in order for senators not to represent the interests of their states. Right. And there's not a lot of nudging Republicans on this because they've been really, really bought into that idea in the last, the last year, really. That it's kind of Ron Paul Jim Dominism, that the, uh, the job of the congressman is to repeal legislation and to repeal regulation and to, and to uh, you know, do absolutely nothing. Everything that comes back to their state is is, is a result of corruption. And that, again, that hasn't it hasn't gotten to that level in this race. It just we got to the first part of that argument, which is that everything should be transparent. Obama lied. Things ha that happen in back room, room, room deals are of you know, of necessity bad things. Um, and yeah, again, totally. I I do think you have to blame the Democrats in Congress and the president for making this fight. I think she could have made all these mistakes um, and won narrowly 
if she if she loses, she would have you know I'd give her a couple points. If this was still a situation, I mean, if the election was in June two thousand nine or something, I, I think that's um, exactly right. You know, one thing that one I, I think mm-hmm. two things on this. One thing I've been thinking a lot about is the regularity with which this happens. So, mm-hmm. you know, we remember Reagan and Clinton as, as really fantastic communicators, people who really had a sense of the country's politics. But of mm-hmm. course, Reagan lost twenty seven seats in his first midterm election, and Clinton mm-hmm. lost fifty four. And Bush would have lost a bunch except for 9-11. He was trending down in the polls as well. And redistricting, actually. Redistricting and redistricting was, was a big deal there yeah. Yeah, as well. Um, and, and so then so I went and looked at it. And you know, a lot of people know these stats. But exactly two presidents since the Civil War have ever gained seats in the election directly after their inauguration. And so it's something you have to say that there is something systemic happening here. Where we bring these guys in, and we, you know, we think they're going to do a good job, and we're excited about their agenda, we voted for their platform. But when we watch that hit the realities of our system, we begin to hate them, hate their agenda, you know, try to bring some other people in, and then we bring those other people in, and as often as not, certainly in the cases of Clinton and Reagan, then we reelect the guys we didn't like a couple months ago, because it turns out those other people are no better.